Let me tell you a little bit about myself so you know who I am, where I'm coming from, a little bit about my, about my background. Uh, as Bo mentioned, I do serve as the Dean of Global Engagement uh, at Indiana Wesleyan, so I have the opportunity to work with students and faculty and staff that are crossing borders. Students that go abroad to study and to serve, uh, faculty that take them. Uh, we also work with international students that are coming to the, to the United States to study at our university. So I have a lot of fun just working with uh, people who are crossing borders. It's kind of in my blood. I was born not in Haiti. I was born in uh, Ohio, but I was raised in Haiti. So when I was two years old, my parents uh, moved us, moved our family to Haiti, where I spent the next seven years of my life. I don't know if you can find little Jimmy in this black and white photo. This was back in the 1900s. This is a long time ago. This is the 20th century was when I, we were missionaries there. Do you, do you see me there? Look for the lady with the sweet bun. I'm sitting on her lap. That's little Jimmy. Jimmy grew up a little bit. Um, uh, dad, if I could find that tie, I would pay big money for that because that is a sweet tie that my dad's... I'm sporting the tie under him there. So this is my upbringing. This was my, uh, where I grew up in another culture. Since then, I've traveled to lots of different places in the world, uh, been to a lot of... Uh, uh, seen God do a lot of things in a lot of different parts of the world. And I've had the opportunity to have my family travel with me as well. Uh, and so just a little bit for you to know who I am. And uh, where I'm coming from, wanted to share uh, a little bit uh, with you about that. I've been asked to talk on this topic of biblical uh, mandates and, and uh, models for missional partnership. And so uh, I'm going to get to this picture a little bit later and why I chose to put it up here. But it's a very meaningful picture for me, and I'll, I think it'll make sense a little bit later. Uh, but somewhere on the table in front of you should be an envelope. Um, if you want to go ahead and grab one of this, this will be your handout. There's one for everybody. And go ahead and grab an envelope. Isn't it fun to get mail? I don't mean like, you know, emails and electronic, this kind of stuff, but an actual piece of paper. Now, before you open it, maybe, maybe you know, do you know how to write an address? Right? Pretend I wrote this to you personally. Write your name on it. Don't put your address. You probably don't worry about that. But put your name on it. Make it personal. If you want to make it from somebody, this is from Jim. I don't know. But take one of these. You're going to need this. And um, there is a little sheet of paper. There's a lot of things in here, and we're going to get to these things. But the first thing I'd love for you to pull out looks something like this. So if you're going to go ahead and grab that, this will help us as we go along. Uh, as I mentioned, I teach at the university, and one of the ways that I keep students awake and alert, especially when we're doing like a night class, is by having some kind of an outline that will keep us moving along. Uh, now, some of them have fun, and they kind of try to guess what's going to, you know, it's a fill-in-the-blank type of thing, so they kind of guess what's the next thing like that. If you want to do that, that's fine as well. But I thought I'd have this for you just so you can follow along and uh, to keep me on track as well during our time together here. So, a couple disclaimers before we jump into these models and mandates. And I can't help but uh, mention these a little bit because I think it's helpful because it'll provide us with a framework for uh, where we're going uh, tonight, if I mention just a few things before we jump into that. Uh, many of you have studied the Bible. Many of you have taught the Bible. You've spent a lot of time in the Bible. Uh, I recognize that we're coming from different spectrums here in the room. There's young and old, and there's everything in between. And so some of these things I want to share, you would know these. Some of these might be new for you. So uh, we'll start with this first one. It's important for us to understand when we're diving into God, God's Word that the Bible is both descriptive and prescriptive. Uh, of course, what we mean by that is as you're reading along, there are some things that you're just reading, and okay, this is describing something that happened. But there's also things when you're reading along, and it's more of a prescriptive, this is something we ought to do. And so when you read scripture, this is one of the uh, main principles that we need to remember. There's fancy words you can study in a Bible class or theology class about exegesis and eisegesis. You want to make sure that we're not reading into a particular text and making it say what we want it to say. Uh, we want to read out of text and try to say, okay, what did it mean then and there? Uh, what was that original content, the original context, and how do we uh, make sense of it uh, today? Another point to remember as we dive into God's Word is that the, Bible, the different biblical texts will have different meanings and, of course, different applications. Have you ever noticed this? You hear somebody teach on the same text maybe two or three or four or five different times, and they're gleaning different insights out of that text, different Meanings. Now, some theologians would say, oh, there's only one original meaning to that text. Well, read the parables. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus taught in parables, and there's lots of layered meanings in there. So there could be multiple meanings, and of course, there's uh, multiple applications to these texts. Another uh, point for us, oh, uh, with this, um, going back to that idea of, of reading the text and understanding it in the original context and then fast-forwarding to today— I think of it as a bridge. So you have the original text that was written, 
uh, provided to somebody of that content, and then you were reading it today, and we're going to get into the Bible tonight and some of the passages tonight. And then you have this long bridge between then and there and here and now. And so what it meant then, once upon a time, and what does it mean now? That's this whole process of interpreting Scripture and, and trying to understand it. Uh, the Bible is a guide, and it's also a mirror. I don't know if you've thought about this before. Uh, you, you're probably familiar with this passage um, in Psalm 119. The word, your word is a lamp to, to guide my feet and a light for my path. So the word of God is a guide for us. It lights our path along the way. But it's also a mirror. I apologize for the jacked up fonts up here. We did this really quickly right before, but hopefully you can read these up here. Uh, but it's also a mirror. If you've ever read in, in James where he talks about you look into the word of God and it's like, you're re it's like a mirror. It's telling you something about yourself. And so you have God's word that guides us, but it also tells us something about ourselves along the way as well. One more and then we'll keep going here. Uh, there are more models than there are mandates uh, in the story of God. There are more models than there are mandates. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. There are mandates. There are uh, scripture, there are, uh, um, you know, commands. There are uh, instructions, 10 commandments, of course, 613 other laws. There's lots of mandates in scripture, but there are a lot more models that we look at. Some of those models that we look at are good models. Yeah, that's a role model for us to follow. Some of those models are very bad role models. You don't want to follow that uh, instruction. So as we're looking at the story of God, as we think about the story that we all are a part of, it's important for us to understand uh, just some of these basic principles uh, as, we, as we dive in here. So let's look at this uh, word or this topic, missional partnerships. Is this a universally understood term, mission and missional? Um, so I'm going to nerd out just for a little bit here. I hope it's okay. Uh, just for us to understand this word, because this word is used in lots of different places. A church will have a mission statement. McDonald's will have a mission statement. You know, so different understandings of that term. So how did that term come about? It's, it's an English term that we use, but it has Latin roots. And that la those Latin roots have to do with sending or to be sent. And uh, the Latin roots go back to Greek roots, the original uh, language of the New Testament. Uh, this word apostello, to send. Uh, so the Greek translation of that word mission has these Greek roots. So when you're reading about apostles, when you're reading about sent ones, things like this, that's what we're talking about when we talk about mission. I love this passage in John uh, where Jesus says, come back uh, from the dead, and he's appearing to his disciples. And he says to them, peace be among you, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. There's that idea, that apostello, that apostolos, this sending nature uh, of God. So it's not a biblical term, it's more of a theological term, uh, so that's important for us to understand. It has to do with the sending activities of God into the world. Uh, Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, so this idea of God uh, sending us out. And for those of you who are history buffs and you're interested to know, well, where did we start using this word? It goes back to the 16th century, where these monks started to be sent out from these different monasteries as sent ones, as missionaries. So... Uh, a little bit of uh, background for the word there. So when we talk about the mission of God, singular mission, we're talking about what God is doing around the world. The missio dei, to use another Latin phrase. The missio dei, the mission of God. But when we talk about missions, plural, these are the different activities of churches that are involved in God's mission. It might be locally, it might be globally. And so we use those terms uh, in a couple different ways. I love what John Fleck writes in his book, the church does not have a mission. The church is missionary. Uh, Karl Barth has this beautiful analogy, and Jordan kind of alluded, it, alluded to it earlier, where we as a church, we gather together, we're uplifted together, and we sent, we're sent out. And it's kind of this, just like the blood pumps through our heart and gives us life, so it is in the church. We gather together, we're uplifted, we're sent out. And there's this rhythm that we have every seven days um, of, of, of the week. There's no participation in Christ without participation in his mission to the world. This is one of those 20th century mission conferences that really churches were getting excited about going to all nations. And this idea was behind there. You might have heard this phrase before, God is a missionary God, and we are on mission with God. Uh, Blackaby in his book really kind of highlighted this about God is active in the world, and we join God in what God is doing in different parts of the world. I love what David Bosch says, the Christian faith is intrinsically 
missionary. So I'm talking to a bunch of people who are here excited about missions and outreach. You know all these kind of things. So I wanted to just give you a little bit of that background, though, and that foundation. So what do we mean, then, about missional partnerships, then? What is that partnership? Well, this is an interesting word. Uh, because this word can have different meanings in different languages. And we're not going to look at all of these in these different languages. But just to point out that as you look at these different cultures and different languages, there are uh, layered meanings uh, to this. You're going to hear a little bit more about uh, the Spanish concept uh, of this, I think, uh, tonight and tomorrow. I've spent quite a, a time in recent years uh, doing some work in China. And so there's this term guanxi that I've been learning about. And this is this mutual benefiting relationship that I have with somebody, this partnership that you have. And it's, it's very much, it's kind of this you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back, but we're tight for life. We're friends uh, for life, this partnership. But where I want to go tonight is this biblical concept of partnership, koinonia, uh, this idea that, uh, of, of sharing, of fellowship, of participation, uh, community with, with one another. And it's a term that Paul uses all throughout his his letters, uh, and we're going to look at one of those letters tonight. So this idea of sharing, fellowship, partnership, uh, sharing with one another. And then one more little kind of historical sidebar note for those of you who are Wesleyan in the room, maybe a few of you. Um, John Wesley understood this concept of our faith being this communal faith, this partnership that we have with one another. This is a phrase, this is a, 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 one of his most often quoted phrases about what it means to this social holiness idea. And what he's saying here is that we cannot really be holy individually on our own. We need one another. We need others in our life who, who together we are, are a living sacrifice, as Romans 12, 1 and, and 2 talk about. So this social holiness idea. There's not this, this personal holiness, yes, but it's also connect, we're connected with one another and we grow together. So if you put these two words together, if you're looking at missional and you're looking at partnership, you know, maybe you're sick of all the etymologies. I don't know. Maybe you're sick of the history. But I wanted to just lay some of that foundation for you before we dive into some of the text, because I think it's helpful for us uh, in understanding that. So here we go. I want to share with you um, uh, just some glimpses, just some, just some, mod some samplings. We're going to land the plane eventually in Paul's letter uh, to the churches in Philippi. So that's where we're headed. But I wanted to give you just a sampling of where you can see this idea of missional partnership all throughout Scripture. Because I think as I've studied this, as I've been looking into this, it's really helped me to understand and appreciate uh, this missional partnership idea and the opportunities we have to do that with one another. So on the back of your sheet, we'll dive right in here and look at these different ones. And again, the disclaimers I made earlier, uh, I want to be careful not to just pick and choose different Scriptures and say, oh yeah, that's what that means, that's what that means. My hope tonight is to encourage you to dig into some of these texts at another time when you have time to, uh, to do that, to look at these stories a little bit more in depth. I'm going to give you kind of a theme that you see in there and then encourage you to uh, dive into this on your own as well. So from the story of creation, right from the very beginning, uh, we learn that the triune God exists and works in partnership. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The triune God works together, works and exists in partnership. So right from the beginning. Uh, I see this in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, I don't know if you noticed this when you've read that passage. Let us make humankind in our image. So right out of the gates, you have this, uh, the triune God who is creating and creating in community. And so God created them, human, humankind in his image, male and female. So right from the beginning, you have a God that is creating and God that is working in partnership. Uh, secondly, from the story of creation, we also learn that we are created for community. Now think about this one for a little bit. As you've read the Genesis story, you know kind of the rhythm of how the poem goes. You know, God created on this day and it was good. And God created on that day and it was good. And God created on it. And finally, when you get to, you know, humans are made and, it, and on that day, it was what was it? It was very good. Yeah, so you kind of have this building. So as you're reading along, it's like God is creating and doing some really cool things, and it's good, and it's good, and it's good, and it's very good. But then you come across kind of this strange statement where one of the things in God's perfect creations is not good. You ever thought about that? Something that God created was not good according to the, to the text. What was it? Yeah, that the first human was alone. 
And so again, right from the very beginning in the story, we read that we are created for community. It was not good that the man was alone. So we're created to be in relationship with each other. That's how we're wired. Uh, now, this is not kind of one of those proof texts, well, if, you know, every person in the room ought to be married then. No, that's not, you're missing the point if you, if you interpret it that way. It's more this idea that we're created for community with others. Sure, marriage is part of that, but the, the body of Christ, uh, human relationships. So from the story of creation, we learn uh, that uh, we're created for community. Number three, also from the story of creation, we get a lot from these first few chapters of the Bible. From the story of creation, we learn that despite sin entering that story, God still longs for this relationship with us. God still wants to have this relationship with us, despite sin entering into that story. One of the most beautiful statements uh, and one of the most theologically jam-packed statements that I find in this early, uh, the early pages of Scripture is after Adam and Eve have fallen, after sin has entered into uh, the story, and you have God saying to them in Genesis chapter 3, verse 9, where are you? Now think about that question for a minute. That's not a, oh, I can't see you because the fig leaves that you're hiding in now, you're kind of camouflaged now, so I can't see you anymore. It's not like he lost track of them, he can't literally see them. I think this is a very theological statement that helps us get a glimpse of the heart of God. The heart of God is to have relationship with us as human beings. God created wonderful things. You know, a platypus is a very wonderful, beautiful animal. Anybody have any platypus pets or anything? I don't know if you do. But God cannot have a personal, intimate relationship with a platypus because a platypus is not created in the image and the likeness of God. Anybody ever see the great redwood trees out west? Beautiful, you know, you're just in awe of God's creation. But God cannot have a relationship with the tree because the tree is not created in the image and the likeness of God. So there's something separate. There's something different about us as human beings. And God longs to have this relationship with us and this partnership with us. So again, some, some things for us to see right from creation. That we are created for community. We're created. God exists in partnership. And God is about relationships uh, with us. If you fast forward a little bit to uh, Genesis chapter 12, you come across this, the story of Abram, who's later named Abraham. And again, I wish we had time to get into all of these stories a little bit more, but I'm trying to set a stage for where we're going to go in Paul's letter uh, in this idea of missional partnership. But I want to give you some of that background. In Genesis chapter 12, you have Abram who's, who's kind of pulled aside, and God says to him, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to make you a blessing to others. Uh, this Hebrew word, barach, which has at its roots, gift. And it's this idea that a gift is given to you, not a gift that you keep to yourself, not a gift that's it's just for me, but it's like one of these gifts that's meant to be shared. You ever get one of these gifts? Uh, think about a, a gift that's meant to be shared. What's an example of one that you can think of? Yeah, friendship. What other gifts are you given, maybe at Christmas or a birthday, that are meant to be shared? Yeah, some kind of a board game. It'd be really lame if you got a board game and you just kind of played it by yourself. Uh, my brother and I were given a gift uh, by my parents uh, when we were missionary kids, and uh, we got a pair of boxing gloves, which is great. Um, and my brother, being the great big brother that he was, he gave me the left-handed boxing glove because I'm right-handed. And so we would have these fights together, you know, the prize fight, and I'm, I'm, you know, I can't even do it now. It's like I can't throw a punch with my left hand. I look weird doing that. So we would have a pair of boxing gloves is maybe not the best gift. Sorry, Mom and Dad. But it is a gift, you know, think of a gift that's meant to be shared, a gift that's meant to be uh, given to others. And this is this idea that, that you find in Genesis chapter 12. Abram, it's not like you're my favorite, you're my, you know, you're my favorite child. It's, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, out of all the nations, I'm going to choose you, and I'm going to bless you. But the reason I'm going to bless you and, the, and the, the generations that will follow you is that you will bless others as well. So we're blessed uh, to be a blessing. The Lord said to Abram, I will bless you and you will be a blessing. Look at all the stars in the sky, Abram. That will be what your descendants are like. Blessed to be a blessing to others. Number five, the story of Israel. From the story of Israel, oh my goodness, thousands of years of history that you can read through the Old Testament. But one of the things that we see, one of the themes that we see related to uh, missional partnerships is that God will gather his people together 
in places. Think the tent of meeting. Uh, think the temple eventually. God gathers his people together, but God also scatters his people. And in so doing, the work of God, the, the mission of God, continues to advance uh, in human history. Now, the gathering part makes sense to us. I mean, I think of the gathering. Yeah, we're, we gather together to worship. We gather together under God's protection, the tent of meeting, all these kind of things. But the scattering one is kind of hard for me to, to wrap my head around. But as you read through this history and as you see how there are times when Israel's history, kind of these high points and these low points, these times when uh, they're, they're, you know, they're just kind of at the, the, the pinnacle of their success, but then these valley times where they're in exile, well, I came across the words of the prophets, and this is just a couple of examples, but there's several times in the prophets where they talk about how God was the one who sent them into exile. God is the one. Probably the most uh, uh, often quoted passage, at least by college students that I work, work with, is Jeremiah 29, 11. You know, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, give you hope and a future. I love that verse. Don't we love that verse? That's all written in the context of them being in exile, uh, being away from their homes, taken away. And so God, he also goes on to say in that, in that passage, he will talk about, you know, plant vineyards in the place of exile where you're at. Uh, start families, you know, pray for the peace of the city. He's not telling them, try to escape that. He's saying, plant yourself in that place of exile. So God gathers together and God scatters. He says here in Ezekiel, I sent them into exile among the nations. I will gather them uh, to their own land as well. So God is gathering and scattering. Isaiah puts it this way. Isaiah even talks about others who will be gathered in during this uh, gathering uh, and scattering as well. So God will gather and God will, will scatter as well. Number six. Boy, this is hard to read. I hope you can read that okay. Uh, from the story of the Shunammite woman. We learn that God uses, I love this phrase. This is how it's used in the NIV, well-to-do people. You know any well-to-do people? This is a rich lady, by the way. A well-to-do person, lots of re resources. God will use well-to-do people to serve the needs of God's servants holistically. Um, uh, my parents run a ministry down in Noblesville for missionaries, and it's a place for them to gather and to get re-energized and rejuvenated and sent back out. We needed this when we were missionaries. We came back and uh, had this type of experience. And this is all rooted in 2 Kings and the story of Elisha who was going from place to place and ministering and serving. And this lady had this idea. She said to her husband, we have some space in our room. Why don't we make this space and we'll have a little place for him when he comes by. It's probably a place where he went regularly. And we'll take care of him. We'll feed him. We'll make him scones, right, mom? Uh, give him some coffee, you know, just energize him, get him where he needs to be so that he can continue this work on. So God will use well-to-do people. He'll use all people, but he'll use well-to-do people to care for uh, his, uh, his, his workers as well. Fast forward to uh, the story of the Gospels, the time of Christ. From the story of Jesus in the Gospels, we learn that we are invited to participate in God's mission in the world with others. It's an invitation it's an invitation to come along uh, with God. I love Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 28, 16 through 20. What do we commonly refer to this as? The great what? The great commission. And you probably heard lots of sermons on this. Maybe you've preached sermons on this. This great commission, I, I would love to, to retitle it sometime if anybody gave me the chance to, which they won't, but as the great invitation. Because that's really more what it is. It's not this, it's not a, a direct command, uh, if you, again, want to look in the language, what you find is the word go is better translated as you're going. So as you go from day to day, as you go to work, as you go to school, as you go from here to there, make disciples. In fact, the only kind of, uh, the only word in this phrase that is more like a command is the word disciple. The others are more participles. They're more just kind of these, uh, this, these uh, descriptive words. So as you go from place to place, make disciples. So God invites us to be a part of his work in the world. And so we respond to that um, as the Spirit leads us. He said to them in Mark chapter 16, go into all the world, preach the good news to all creation. And of course, the disciples then did this. We often think of God, uh, God's word in this great commission being something 
uh, after his death and his resurrection and his ascension. You know, it kind of comes afterwards. Oh, that's when we started preaching the gospel. That's when the mission of God started. But we oftentimes forget that Jesus was doing this earlier on. And he sends out the 72. He sends out the 12. Remember that story? But then he also sends out the 72. He sends them out together. They're not sent out alone. They're never sent out alone. They're sent out together. So again, this theme we're exploring these next two days, missional partnership. It's not about me going and doing my own thing, but it's about how do I lock arms with others and together do this? One of the models that you see in scripture is this model of going in at least uh, two by twos. He goes on to talk about, you know, eat what's ever put in front of you. And, you know, if people don't like you, shake the dust from your foot from that city. I don't know what that means. I, you know, anyway, but lots of different interpretations of that. But he sends them out and he sends them with the good news. He sends them to proclaim the kingdom of God. From the story of Jesus, particularly in Luke's gospel, we find that God will sometimes use creative ways to finance his work. I love this one. Reading along in Luke chapter 8, you meet this group of women uh, who are Jesus' disciples. Remember, he didn't just have the 12 disciples. He had lots of disciples, 72. We don't know the number for sure. But there's this group of women that were financing his ministry. Do you ever think about that? How, well, what did the disciples do when they took this three-year sabbatical and just kind of hung out with Jesus? How did they pay their bills? How did they, you know, eat their meals? Who, who provided for it? Well, it was this group of women. And if, did you ever notice Joanna? Who's Joanna? The wife of Cusa, the manager in Herod's household. Isn't that hilarious? Herod is financing Jesus' ministry, kind of indirectly. I find that a little bit humorous. But you see how God uses creative ways, and even ways that we might partner with people who are not followers of God for the mission of God to move forward. This kind of goes, this relates to that picture I showed you at the very beginning. These are a couple of friends of mine that I've gotten to know over the past six, seven years uh, in Beijing. One is a believer, one is not. And some of the work that we've been doing uh, at the university by taking students abroad to serve and teach English and do these things and taking folks from uh, College Church and other churches in Grant County to go over uh, to Beijing to use English as a platform to build relationship. The majority of that work is being financed by the Chinese government. God uses creative ways <laughs> to move his mission forward. And we, we oftentimes get locked into these ways. Well, this is the only way that God's going to do it. This is the way we're going to have to move forward. Well, there might be other creative ways uh, where God wants to, to do that. Maybe it's Herod, like it was for the, the, the ladies who are financing Jesus' ministry. Maybe it's the government of China. Maybe it's somebody in your community. Maybe it's somebody who you might connect with who wants to get involved with your church or your mission or whatever, and they're not a believer yet. Like, can we take their money? And all of God's people said, yes, of course you can, because God might use that and use you to make a connection, and that would be a way for them uh, to start connecting uh, with God in, in different ways. A couple more, and then we're going to go to Paul. From the, story in uh, from the story of Jesus in Matthew's gospel, we learn that we're not alone. Isn't that great to know? We're not in this work alone. We don't do this work alone. Going back to this uh, Matthew 28 passage, the, the, the last part of it there, I am with you always. You're not going out alone. We don't go into our communities alone. We don't go into the world alone. The work of God that, that we've been called to in different spheres and different places, we don't go alone. We have the creator of the universe, the triune God, living in us, working through us. We don't uh, go alone. There's this, uh, there's this wonderful theological concept that um, uh, kind of relates to this uh, that we talk a little bit about in the Wesleyan denomination called prevenient grace. It's this idea that God goes before a person before they ever accept Christ. So if you think about somebody who maybe grew up in some other religion or maybe no religion or whatever, and some missionary or some pastor or some disciple, somebody comes along and, and builds a relationship with them and shares the good news with them. Prevenient grace is, and they respond to it. And they say yes, and they're a believer. Prevenient grace is this idea that God is working in that person, that it's not just by chance that your path and their path crossed, but God was actively doing that. You're partnering with God, and God is working in that person's heart and life, and the two of your lives interconnected for whatever reason, and God used that to change their life for all of eternity. We're not alone in this work. 
God is actively working and moving in people's lives, and we join uh, with that. Number 10, you still there? Everybody okay? You got hand cramps yet from writing? Okay. Uh, Number 10, from the story of Jesus in John's gospel, we learn that we are chosen by Christ to go and to bear fruit. He says to his disciples, you did not choose me, I chose you to bear fruit. But it's interesting in this text, if you look at it, which you can't see on the screen. But anyway, you did not choose me. Look down at the bottom there. He talks about go and bear bear fruit. Whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. And then he says, this is my command. Love one another. So there's something connected with this bearing fruit that we are loving one another and doing that. So as we love one another and as we go and as we bear fruit, it's all connected here. So it's not just, well, I'm a banana and I'm going to go do my banana thing. And you're an apple, and you go do your apple thing. No, we we come together, and we love one another together, and the mission of God moves forward together, okay? All right, number 11. From the story of the early church, we learn that God calls us to go and to send. And there are those who go, of course, we all go when we leave church. We go out into our communities, but God calls some of us to go beyond our communities. God gives some of us different skills and and abilities, and and we're sent out uh, to other parts of the world and other parts of the country. So we go, and then there are those who are sent. So we're all involved with this. We need both. This beautiful passage in Acts chapter 13, where they came alongside Paul and Barnabas, and they laid their hands on them, and they sent them out, filled with the Holy Spirit, into the work uh, that God had called them to. So there are those who go, and there are those who send. Also from the story of Barnabas and Paul, which I, I... I thought about maybe not including this one because this is one that's a little bit more difficult for us to wrestle with. But I thought, no, we need to, we can't ignore this. We can't ignore this, that the, the fact that in, whenever human relationships come together, sometimes there's conflict. Maybe not sometimes, there's typically conflict. And sometimes you can work through that conflict, but sometimes you just can't. And so as I've reflected on this story of Paul and Barnabas and how they get in an argument, you know, Paul wants to go back to, or Barnabas wants to go back to some of the churches and Uh, visit them. And Paul's like, yeah, I don't think so. I think God wants me to go somewhere else. And by the way, I found this guy named Silas, and I think he should travel with us. And Barnabas is like, well, I don't know about that guy. He's a little shady. He's an electric guitar player. I'm not sure what he, sorry, that was Silas, my son. But but he's like, I want to take Silas. And and Barnabas says, no, I want to take John. And so they get in this argument. And you're thinking, you guys are doing the the work of God. You're, You're ministers. You're missionaries. Why are you arguing over these things? But have you ever been in that place where it's, in some cases, it might be better for the kingdom if you split. And the unfortunate thing is we don't hear much more about Barnabas. We don't hear about his stories and his travels and where he went. Uh, you hear more about Paul and Silas and where they go from this point on. But sometimes, sometimes in this work, we have to part ways with people. And sometimes it might even be people that were spiritual mentors to us, people who were role models for us. Remember Barnabas was the guy who came alongside Paul and mentored him, discipled him, and eventually they split ways. So I'll let you wrestle with that one. What does that one look like? Because that one's a little bit hard for us, but it is one of these models we can't just ignore uh, in, in, uh, as we look at God's word about missional partnerships. Finally, oh, this is that passage, sorry. There was such a sharp disagreement among them that they parted companies. So, Let's land this plane. Number 13, from the story of Paul, we learn that we cannot do this work alone. If you've heard a theme over these different different texts we've been exploring a little bit, there's a theme here that we cannot do this work alone. We must partner with the body of Christ to fulfill God's mission. And this brings us back to that word uh, when we were doing some of the etymologies, koinonia, fellowship, sharing, this is all throughout Paul's writings. But I love when we get to the, the letter in, uh, that he writes to Philippi because it's just it's scattered in this, in this letter and it's really explicit for us. So on one of his missionary journeys, Paul's traveling and uh, as I mentioned, he was traveling with Silas. Timothy joins them. So now the band's together and they're going from place to place. And one of the places they land was Philippi. And if you remember some of that story, you remember that there was a, a woman there named Lydia. What do you know about Lydia? What do you remember about her? 
Yeah, something about purple cloth. <laughs> yeah, there's something about purple cloth. Well, she was this businesswoman, and she was a dealer in purple cloth, and purple cloth was used for royalty, and, you know, so she was doing very well. And she had an encounter. God was working in her life, and God brought these, these guys along uh, her path, and they, they, they shared the gospel with her. She becomes a Christian. Acts 16, you can read it. It's believed that it was her home where this little church of Philippi began. She opened her home, and the believers started to gather. Predominantly Gentiles there, not Jews. Paul's ministry, as you remember, started going to Gentiles. And so this woman opens her home, and this church begins uh, to meet there regularly. So fast forward to the end of Paul's life. He's gone all over the world, taken the gospel here, there, and everywhere, and he's finally in Rome. He's, in, he's under house arrest. He is you know, at the end of his ministry, and so he starts writing these letters to these different churches that he had uh, planted, that he had helped to start. And one of those letters that he writes is to this church in Philippi. And the church in Philippi, man, this, this was a church that was very near and dear to Paul's heart. And you'll, you'll hear it in the words that you're about to read. I see some of you have already grabbed the blue sheet of paper. You, you went ahead of me, and you grabbed, okay, if you haven't, it's okay. I would love for one of you to uh, take this blue sheet of paper, and I would love for one of you at each of the tables to read it aloud, okay? So uh, I want you to not only read it and see it, but to hear it read to you, okay? So this is just a portion of Paul's letter, and see if as you're reading it, you kind of hear this missional partnership theme rise in these words of, of Paul. Go ahead and read it. Aren't those beautiful words? Do you have anybody in your life that, that has, I don't know if they've ever said it to you, uh, but I love you with the affection of Christ Jesus. I long for you. I love you. I, I care so deeply for you. I mean, these were people that uh, you can tell he really, they meant a lot to them. He talks about this partnership, this koinonia, this fellowship, this sharing. He was not out there being the rock star missionary doing all these things. He realized that he could not do this without these people. And we don't know these people. We don't know all their names. We know a little bit of their story, Lydia and a few others. But we don't know a lot about these people. But these were people that Paul was, was he loved them, he cared for them, and he could not do this work uh, without them. Uh, and he says, God can testify how I long for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And then he goes on and talks about this love that he hopes abounds in them because he realizes that the root of this whole thing is love. We love people, we love God, and this mission of God uh, moves forward. So I wanted us to, to have those words of Paul. I wanted us to, when, when Bo first asked me to talk on this topic, that was immediately where I went, was Paul's relationship with the church in Philippi and this, 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 this fellowship that they had together, that one could not do the work without the other, and the work of God moved forward. It moved forward locally in Philippi, and it also moved forward globally as they sent Paul. They were a part of that sending Paul to different parts of the world. Uh, many of your churches, if not all of them, probably have that missional model, local and global. We need both of these happening together. But it doesn't happen without God. Uh, we, God is the one at work, and we join God in that, and we together move this mission of God forward. Well, I love uh, conferences like this and festivals like this because it's a chance for us to dig into things like this and dive into these, uh, you know, God's word and to hear from great people doing different things around the world. I can't wait to hear Alex here in a few minutes. Um, but this is something where I, if, we, if we don't just, if we're not intentional about this, we will not uh, continue to grow. I love these words from Mary uh, Letterlighter. She said, it's good intentions are not enough to ensure good outcomes in cult cross-cultural partnerships. We need to be willing to keep learning to be fruitful in missions. This is not something that we just check off a box and say, oh yeah, I've read those texts, I've gone to that seminar, I know what this is about. No, we gotta continue to learning. So thank you both for organizing something like this where we can learn together. Well, as I was thinking about how we could end this uh, first session together and kind of this theme of this Paul's letter and his, his, his words uh, uh, to these people who were a part of his mission, I thought, you know what, there might be people in your life that you want to write a thank you note to. People who, I don't know if you would say the same words that Paul did here, but who are the people that are coming alongside you 
in helping to advance your, your work, whatever it is that you're called to. Paul's letter in to, in, to the churches in Philippi was a thank you letter. It was a thank you note. Now it's several chapters, so you don't have to write several chapters. But take out that thank you note if you would. It's stuffed in your envelope somewhere. And I want you to, for the next couple of minutes, just be thinking about who is, who is someone, or maybe it's a, someone's, maybe it's a couple, but who would be someone that you would want to thank for the partnership, for, for whatever that partnership might look like? I have no idea what that looks like for you. If you want to use Paul's words, you can. If you want to use your own, I encourage you to use your own. But think about that. Take a minute. Uh, if the words start flowing, start writing it now. I'll give you some space to do that. If you'd rather do this later, that's okay. But let's just take a couple of minutes. And as you're writing, as you're thinking about these people, maybe whisper a prayer of thanks uh, to them, uh, to God for them as well. And then we'll close in prayer in a minute.